specialised hospital services. The supervision of the Chief Medical Officer, the Chief Nurse and the Delivery Officer, and the Chief Allied and Sergeant Health Advisor, and is also responsible for a significant capital projects including the development of new Royal Hospital, the new SA Health and Medical Research Institute building, and the redevelopment of the Glenside campus. The word reform is a theme through David's work. So I took the opportunity to look at the Oxford Dictionary. This is defined as a change in something, typically a social, political, or economic institution, or practice in order to improve it, that is to make it better. In my membership of the Royal Australian College of Surgeons, uh, I would like to have shared with everyone before David uh, speaks, is that one of the last newsletters we received from our uh, state president, he wrote a decisive article regarding the College of Surgeons' concerns regarding some aspects of the new RAH development, such as the cost expenditure, the siting for medical schools, etc. So, at this stage, I'd like to ask David to come up to the podium to reassure us regarding the development of the new Roman Hospital. And this morning when I was at the Helping Hand Centre, seeing a patient who could come across this brochure, says, I have a concern. David, I'd like you to demonstrate that you should have no concern regarding the new Orlando Hospital. David, welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction, John, and thank you to the Rotary for inviting me along this afternoon. And, and certainly what I will endeavour to do is to reassure you about um, the new hospital and why we're doing it and how we're doing it and what's the core vision behind that. Um, and quite rightly, as John indicated, it is about reform. It's about the way in which we actually develop and prepare our health services to deal with the um, biggest event it's going to have to deal with over the next few years which is the health of our population, the changing needs, the fact that we're all getting older, the fact that we're increasingly suffering from chronic disease as opposed to acute episodes of illness. And so what I want to do is just really take you through um, why and where of the hospital. And so the journey so far, for me personally now, I'm sort of five or six years into the journey. And having done the original planning work in the business case back in 2006-07. And we then spent some time, once the hospital was announced, developing the specification, the brief for the hospital, and, and then going to the market in order to find a partner who could work with us to develop and build the hospital. And all of that culminated in final negotiations during 10-11 and financial close being achieved on the contract with the private sector in June 2011. Um, and very quickly after that, you began to see the ground being broken on the site, and I'll come to that in a moment. And the hospital opens not just in 2016, not just in April 2016, but the 18th of April 2016. That is the date of the contract, that is the date the hospital has to be delivered, and if our private partner fails to deliver that date, there are substantial penalties to be paid, approximately about a million dollars a day to the state, but every day that it is late beyond that stage. And so, getting to 2016 will mean that we will have a state-of-the-art tertiary paternity hospital, like a specialist sort of hospital, with 800 beds in. On a world scale, that is a phenomenal rate of progress. Most areas of the world where these sorts of hospitals are developed, and there's only been about a dozen in the last 30 years across the whole of the world, that have all been built in one go, of this size, of this scale, doing this sort of work. And most of them take between 20 and 30 years. Indeed, a few years ago, um, about three years ago, I was over in the UK, um, at the, just after the opening of the University College Hospital in London, um, and that one took 30 years to come to fruition. Back in the 90s, I did the original planning work for um, the Royal London Hospital Redevelopment. That opened last Christmas. 
So again, it took over 20 years to come to fruition. So to achieve this in 10 years within the study is a significant achievement on a world-class study. And in terms of the precinct, and it, it is more than the hospital, it is a large precinct over there. First of all, it's double the size of the existing hospital campus. Um, and there's plenty of room on that site, not just for our new hospital, but also for the SA Health and Medical Research Institute, which is the building you can see out of this window over there going up as we speak. And we've got the topping out ceremony of that on Friday morning because the top floor of that is now complete in terms of its structure. And we also have ample room for the relocation of the medical school. And again, Adelaide University are in discussions with the University of South Australia um, about potentially sharing a building to bring together not just medicine, but medicine, nursing, and allied health training all into one, into one facility, which will be on the precinct as well. And that will be opened by 2016, uh, and we'll probably get to start building that at the end of the um, middle of next year. So those negotiations are well in train. Even with all those developments on the site, we'll still have about two hectares. Uh, sorry, what? with those developments on the site, and leaving room for the hospital to grow by 30%, so almost a third in the future, we will still have two hectares of open space on that site. So we really believe we're future-proofing in terms of future development needs of the health business over the next 50 to 60 years. In terms of the vision for what we're trying to achieve within the new hospital, it is about high-quality health services in a modern setting. It's about getting a real mix of health, research, education, all working together on the same precinct. And clearly that's one of the things which has worked well in the past on the existing site, in terms of the co-location of those activities. But in all three areas, education, research, and health service delivery, we are literally running out of space. And therefore, relocating onto a new, bigger precinct allows that to grow and expand and serve the state well into the future. We also wanted the hospital to be a leader in innovation for the state, nationally and internationally. And it is that, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. We also wanted to ensure that we learned the lessons from those other examples around the world about how you can build these facilities so that they are a healing environment. And they are a place which actually fosters well-being and recovery for patients, as well as providing a high-quality environment for staff. And so patient-centered care, again, I'll say more about that in a moment, is a key feature of what we're trying to achieve. Because all the evidence is that if we actually create the right environment within our health facilities, people do get better more quickly, and therefore get out and back home, back to their families with them. And that's good for everybody. And in terms of the model of care, first and foremost, provision of safe care. So we need to ensure that the care we're providing is safe and we do no harm. Patient-centered care. And this is the real argument for why we've made the decision to have 100% single room with on suites for inpatients within the new hospital. We wanted to create a space which was private, was confidential, and which was large enough for care to be delivered at the bedside. Because much of what happens in our current hospital is determined by what can be done at the bedside and moving patients elsewhere in the hospital to have things done to them. So in the average length of stay in the existing rural Adelaide, which is about six days, um, a patient will get moved between eight or nine times to have things done to them. Now some of those things have to be done in, in particular places, like obviously surgery in an operating room. But much of the activity could take place at the bedside if there was the space to do that, if there were the right conditions. And by doing it at the bedside, by doing it next to where, to where the patient is, then it's better for the patient. It improves the length of stay, it reduces the length of stay, it reduces some of the waiting within the system. So patient-centered care is an important aspect of what we're trying to achieve within the new hospital, and that's physically embodied in the new hospital. That's also the issue about focusing on clinical pathways. So, for example, if you're unfortunate enough to suffer from a stroke at present within South Australia, you will, nine times out of ten, be taken to the emergency department and you will be assessed um, within that department and then moved on to the stroke specialists. 
That increasingly is becoming an issue in terms of good quality safe care because there are things that we can do within the first couple of hours after you've had a stroke in terms of taking an image of your brain, seeing where the, where the bleed is in your brain, to see whether one of the new pharmaceutical products available would actually deal and stem that bleed. If it does, then you don't have the side effects normally associated with the stroke. What works best for stroke patients is rather than go to the ED, have a direct pathway to where the stroke specialist is, where the imaging facility is, in order for you to bypass the ED and go straight to the, to, to the doctor that you need to see. Likewise, if you've had a heart attack, we now have our ambulance services doing 12 lead ECGs in the ambulances. They know by the time you've got to the hospital you've had a heart attack. So again, why put you into an emergency department when you could go straight through to the cath lab and to the cardiologist and be treated? That's what good clinical practice says we should do, but our buildings don't let us do that for them. In the new hospital, we've literally got physical pathways that will go directly to those elements of the hospital, bypassing the emergency department altogether. So clinical pathways overseen by clinicians with key critical decision-making by clinicians on those pathways is built into the hospital. Um, I've already talked to you about avoiding duplication and reducing waiting times. We also need to reduce the volume through the ED. We know, you all know, from what you see in the media or what we experience ourselves, the pressure on our emergency departments, because they are funnels that we put everything through to get into the hospital. If we can bypass the ED where it's safe to do so and get you straight to the care that's required, then we should be doing that. Another example would be mental health. You know, we need to make sure, and we will in the new hospital, have a specific area dedicated to patients with mental health issues who are in crisis. Rather than going into the ED, they go into a secure area managed by the psychiatrists and mental health staff, not by the ED doctors and ED nurses who are less well equipped to cope with somebody in mental health with a crisis. So again, physically building that. Another new for Australia is to have distributed imaging. So by that, um, in most of our hospitals across Australia, we have centralised imaging. We have one department where the CTs, the X-ray, the MRI scanners are. That creates another bottleneck, another waiting point, another queuing point within the system. In the new Royal Adelaide, we will have a dispersed system, so there are four different hubs for imaging throughout, one dedicated to emergency, one to inpatients, one to outpatients, one to the operating theatres and intensive care, all connected digitally, that all the images are taken and then read centrally by the radiologists, so we're not spreading our staff around, but we're using technology to more reduce waiting and get a better outcome for patients and for our staff. And that's a first, and that happened because a number of our clinicians, our radiologists, went overseas, they saw what was happening elsewhere and well, came back and said, we want that here in our new hospital. And a high use of automation. Again, lots of examples around the world where automated systems, whether it's for um, making up pharmaceutical packages, whether it's for distributing goods on automated guided vehicles throughout the system, all of those things we've maximised upon to have within the new hospital in order to ensure that we have an efficient facility as possible. So in terms of the new RA and its design, it's flexible and adaptable in its building form. So for the engineers in the room, it has a very straightforward grid system, 9 meter square grid. It's very easy to change it over time. So that we've got a very simple form because we know that within the lifetime of this sort of hospital, as we've seen with the existing Royal Adelaide, we will want to change in relation to changing medical practices and different needs. And we need a simple, cost-efficient way to do that. It's one of the reasons why Victorian hospitals have lasted so long, is because the Florence Nightingale Ward is a very good physical structure that can easily change from being um, an open ward to offices, to a laboratory, to a teaching space, to back to single rooms for clinical care. It can be used in a variety of different ways. The whole of this hospital is based upon that principle, very simple engineering principle, in order to give us future flexibility. <coughs> We've got a significant increased capacity in terms of our 800 beds, 700 overnight and 100 a day. 40 technical suites, which is what we're calling operating theatres. And 40, all 65 square metres as a core space. Makes them the biggest in Australia. Um, it is the standard that was going to be adopted across Australia until the body that comes up with those standards realised that by coming up with 65 it would make all other operating theatres apart from ours in Australia deficient. And so they went for 53 square metres to get the maximum captured within that guideline. But 65 gives us the, the potential to be able to build in, again, robotics, new technology, new equipment as medical practice develops. 
and multiple entry points. Again, we don't want to be just funneling in through the ED or through a main door. If you're arriving yourself and you're frail, if you're bringing an elderly patient, you need to be able to come to a drop-off point, be able to deposit your elderly relative in an arrival lounge, park a car, and then go straight up to the treatment area. So lots of different entrance points into this new hospital. And as I've already said, use of smart technology for pharmacy, the automated guided vehicles, and that's what that picture is there. It trolleys sit on top of that, and it is there taking um, all supplies throughout the entire hospital. They have their own dedicated corridors and elevators um, to be able to deliver um, throughout the day within the facility without getting in the way of patients or staff. Um, mobile communications, this is a, a wireless hospital, so most of the medical records will be on iPads, iPhones, or whatever the equivalents are within um, the next five years when the hospital opens. Um, another interesting feature, all our inpatient beds are digital battery way patients, which is very important in terms of getting dosages right for pharmacy, etc. We have huge oc health and safety issues at the moment because nurses lifting patients and increasingly heavy patients um, in order to weigh them, where we can actually have beds that do it for us. So let's have a look. Overall, the hospital will be more efficient to operate um, because of its particular design, because of the use of, of a whole range of energy saving um, elements, then we're going to be using less energy, less water, and about a 40% reduction in CO2 emissions compared to the existing Royal Adelaide. And given that the Royal Adelaide, along with the rest of our hospitals, is probably the biggest bit of government that contributes to CO2 emissions, by reducing those in the, Royal Adelaide, the new Royal Adelaide, we're making a significant impact on the, uh, the amount of CO2 produced in the state as a whole. Smart technology again, maximising natural light and fresh air about how we create that, that healing environment. All of our single rooms look out onto green vistas, again, because not because we're trying to create a five-star hotel environment, but because the evidence tells us that if you can see natural light, if you can see greenery when you're ill, you recover better and faster. So it's part of our efficiency, it's part of creating a healing environment. And adaptable for the future, I've already talked about the flexible modular design in terms of the engineering. It's built to modern earthquake standards, is able to, to withstand, not just withstand the high stand up after an earthquake in Adelaide, but to carry on working as a hospital for at least 48 to 72 hours after the earthquake is hit, because this is our major trauma hospital and needs to be able to deal with the casualties that might arise from the earthquake. I've already talked about the capacity for future growth um, and being able to adapt to new medical technologies. In terms of how we're delivering it, um, as I said, it is in partnership with SA Health Partnership, which is it's a public-private partnership. It means that we transfer a lot of the risks around the building of this type of hospital to the private sector, um, because this is not something which the government has a great deal of experience with building. Um, and so there are very places in the world that have built this sort of hospital, so we need to look at ways of reducing the risk to the state. Um, by going down the PPP route, um, we're able to do that. Um, it's a 35-year contract, the first five years is designing and building, and then the remainder of the term of 30 years is the private sector providing the non-clinical services, so the catering, the cleaning, um, the maintenance, the landscaping, the pest control, all the things that have to happen of a non-clinical nature within the hospital. Government still provides all the clinical services and we run and manage the hospital. We don't hand over the management of our critical bit of health infrastructure to the private sector. And then also as part of that arrangement in 2046, um, when I will be 84, um, then we will do an audit, and I intend to be part of an audit team, as I know what's going to make this, um, or hopefully I'll still around them. Um, it has to be handed over as good as new. Not as it was in 2016, but ready and good as new as it would be in 2046. In terms of the um, cost, then again, 1.85 billion is the cost of the, the hospital itself. Um, there's an, another 244 million, which is the cost of the equipment that's going into the new hospital that the state has to, to pay. Um, so MRIs, video accelerators, cancer treatment, etc., etc. We've just ordered our first piece of equipment, which is a hyperbaric chamber, which is the air pressure container um, used uh, to, again to aid recovery and to deal with certain conditions. That piece of equipment will take probably about a year to build. It's bespoke built. It's going to weigh 70 tonnes. And it has to go in quite early on in the process in order to make sure we can get it into the building. Um, so 
Um, already started to use them, that 244 million in terms of the equipment, giving a total cost of just over $2 billion. Where we're at in the process at the moment, um, the last 15 months, there's been activity going out on, on the site in terms of the remediation. Um, within the next week, that will be completed. Um, we've put in 400 pilings of the 2,000 pilings that need to go in to create the foundations. You'll start to see the, 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 it come out of the ground towards Christmas time. While all that groundwork has been going on, we've been working on the, the insights. And so we've had over 80 planning teams, both clinicians from across the hospital, the existing hospital, working on the detail of their clinical areas. There are something like oh, just over 7,500 rooms in this new hospital. Each of those has to be designed, drawn, architectural drawings, engineering, servicing, all of that has to come together. That's what the team's working on at the moment. We've been using um, prototypes, we've got a, a warehouse facility out in Carolta Park to be able to um, test out things like the single rooms, what makes most sense, what deals with infection control best. And we're also about to launch a major patient and community engagement exercise around some of those features to get their views on some of the elements of the hospital. And I'm aware now we're up to my last sort of couple of minutes, so just some images just to... There we go. Um, so, this is the hospital as it will look. So this is Port Road, West Terrace, North Terrace, the emergency department with a helicopter above it over here. Um, this is the main sort of foyer entrance to the hospital. This is the um, research institute, which you can see being built now, so immediately adjacent to the hospital. And again, a main pedestrian entrance across on the east side. This houses the um, cancer, comp the complex comprehensive cancer center. <coughs> adjacent to Samri because of our key interest in cancer research um, and allowing clinicians and researchers to work well with each other. And this is the view from across the river, looking back, and these are the inpatient blocks, all the single bedrooms, 80% looking out over the parklands and the river, 20% looking over internal <coughs> courtyards to give those green vistas. This is uh, the image from the eastern end, so where Samri and the hospital face each other. Um, the open glass square area to the top there is um, the academic learning centre. So that's got lecture theatres and simulation laboratories for supporting the education and training of clinicians in the hospital. An indication of the interior, the main concourse, again, again giving you that sense of the airiness, the lightness uh, of the building. Um, this is the single room. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale, the window there is two meters by two meters. That um, is a, a day bed in the window bay there. So that every single patient will have the opportunity to have a carer, a relative, a family member staying in the room with them. That's particularly important for our patients who come from, from country South Australia, who often bring a, a, a family member with them who currently have to stay in nurse accommodation or hotel accommodation, they'll be able to stay in the room with the patient. With, with the, patient. Uh, the en suite there, uh, the room is 18 square metres, so again, very spacious in terms of the types of activities that need to happen in the room. And last but not least, the intensive care bedrooms, again, single rooms with park vistas, um, and these are 25 square metres. Um, so what I'm trying to give you is a sense of where we're at with the programme, what we're trying to achieve within the, the hospital. It is currently going to plan. We are on schedule and I have every belief and confidence that the hospital is going to open, as say, on the 18th of April 2016. Thank you very much. Few questions. John. Thank you very much for uh, most of you who made the talk. I'm a psychiatrist. But the question I want to ask is uh, what systems or flows are we going to try and uh, work out to prevent cluttering up of beds with uh, people who can't find a place to stay? So that brings us to the implementation of the overall SA Healthcare Plan, because clearly what we're trying to do, if we take that concept of the patient journey, 
the journey doesn't start just in the hospital. It's about what happens in primary care, <coughs> in, in, in community services, what happens increasingly in aged care services, and how we make sure that we're able to move people through. So there is a significant investment in those other services happening in parallel to the development of this hospital to ensure that we have got a flow through um, and are using the facility appropriately. And it's also why, as I indicated earlier on, within the hospital we're looking at those specific clinical pathways and mental health being one. We, we will have there's a 40 bedded uh, mental health service in the new hospital. It's literally back to back with the emergency department. Um, so that the psychiatric intensive care facility sits between the two and can be better managed than currently is the case uh, within our existing hospital. So a lot of thought about how to get people in and out quickly and at the end of the day, as you will be aware, we want to try and keep people as in a hospital like this for as little time as possible because hospitals are not really good places for people uh, and certainly you know, there are numerous studies which indicate that the longer somebody's in hospital, the more potential risk for them to deteriorate and for their, their health to go downhill. And indeed, in worst case, for them to die of an infection they get in hospital, which they didn't have before they came in. So we want to reduce and keep them in the hospital for only the minimum amount of time, which does mean the rest of the system has also got to be reformed as part of this process. Thank you. Any further questions? Members? Yes? Chris. Thank you, David, for that for excellent talk. I, you've touched on something that is in the back of my mind. I guess um, most of us are aware that, that these days one of the most dangerous places you can be in terms of serious infection is in a hospital. Is there anything that has been done in this hospital to obviate that? Again, that's part of the, the issue around having single rooms. Um, because there is a fair bit of evidence about single rooms helping reduce cross-infection. Um, although I have to say, being absolutely upfront and honest, that it, it's not as big a factor as making sure that our doctors and nurses and other staff wash their hands properly, um, because that's often the commonest source of cross-infection. Um, the way in which we have designed the facility overall, though, is to make sure that we minimise the opportunities for infection. So that goes down to the choice of materials uh, and the way in which materials get replaced because again, if you look around the existing Royal Adelaide um, and many of our other hospitals, um, we don't do the routine maintenance that perhaps we should and we don't replace surfaces, for example, as frequent should. So that is all built into the 30-year contract and is the responsibility of the, the private partner and there's a very clear regime about how that, that comes into force. And the other thing which is, is um, novel for the hospital and again is almost unique in Australia is that for our operating theatres, our technical suites, um, all of their instruments are being delivered again by automated vehicles in sealed containers. So within the sterile supplies area, the lists go up as to what equipment is needed, they're put into metal boxes, those are sealed, they go on to an automated guided vehicle and delivered to the operating theatre, into the operating theatre, they're only opened in the operating theatre, used and put back inside those boxes and sealed before they leave again. And again, it's, it's one of the ways in which we can improve some of our cost infection issues. So there's a variety of different things that we've done to try and ensure that we make this a very safe environment for patients and the staff. <coughs> Thank you, David. I think you all agree this has been an incredibly informative session. Very eternally grateful for your presentation today, David. Now, as is tradition with our club, we always leave with a small memento. This has been some ancient custom, I believe, and it's probably well before. And I don't know how much use may have for it being with the iPads and the automation you're talking about, including the AGDs. But I'd like to present to you, David, a small memento of the occasion, so when you go away, it's not only seeing the sense of postcard. <laughs>